Hey, welcome to another episode of Living Inside Out with Daniel Amstutz. I said episode, but really we're coming to you via the internet, Karis Facebook Live. What a blessing to be able to do this each Friday afternoon at 2.30 Mountain Standard Time. And we've got about a half an hour together, so I want to uh, just quickly say that this is interactive. We love hearing from you. We love getting your questions and comments uh, as it pertains to our topic. And our topic, as most of you already know, is New Covenant Worship and Living Life in Christ and why that is so different today under a New Covenant compared to what life was like under the Old Covenant. Thank God it is different, and boy is it better. We've got a better covenant, we've got better promises, and we've got a better way to worship and a better way to live. So uh, we have prayer ministers standing by who would love to be able to pray with you. If you've got anything on your heart that we can help you with, call our prayer ministry at 719 area code 635-1111 and uh, let one of our prayer ministers minister to you. And it would be our honor and delight to do so. So are you ready to get into the word of God today? Amen. Did you know that even though the Holy Spirit has always been here, he's not always been able to abide in our hearts? Okay? He was given. The Holy Ghost was given. And did you know, I didn't even realize this until several years ago now, but I didn't realize that the Holy Ghost had to be given to the church. It wasn't just an automatic kind of thing. And so we've talked about how the presence of God, we described it as the omnipresence of God, meaning that God's presence has always been everywhere. Omni meaning everywhere, right? And so God has always been here in in terms of an omnipresence. But then when we are born again, the very presence of God becomes an abiding presence because of Jesus. It's only available to those of us that are believers, Right. So now the presence of God moves indoors and it becomes the abiding presence of God. And then we talked about how Jesus is the way, the truth and the life and that no man can have a relationship with God as father apart from receiving what Jesus did for us. Believing and receiving that work of grace that that Jesus has provided for every one of us. Hallelujah. So this mystery was hidden for generations and the revelation that was revealed uh, was reserved for the church age. And this is the age that you and I are living in right now. And that is that the presence of God, the Holy Spirit would be given. Hallelujah. And now lives inside of us as an abiding presence. Um, you know, it, I like to say it this way. It's about habitation and not visitation. And, you know, many of us realize now as we're approaching the holiday season and we talk about how a, uh, God has given to us his son and how a son has been given. And, you know, I love that, but I never really thought about the Holy Spirit needing to be given. I realize that the Holy Spirit's always been here. Uh, Genesis talks about how he brooded over the waters that covered the globe. And out of all of that beginning creation, you know, the Holy Spirit is the one who helped all of that process happen. So he's been around for a long time. He's just as much God as God the Father and God the Son. And we have talked about that in the past as well. So I want to get into some scripture today because as we look at this scripture, I want you to remember this is pre-cross that we're talking about. Okay, This is before the cross. And Jesus is speaking to this group of people here who are all living without the Spirit of God living in them. So let's look at what Jesus said. Okay, John chapter 7 verse 38 through 39 says, on that last day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, 
whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given. There it is. The Holy Spirit was what? The Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So this is John chapter 7, verse 37 and 38. So notice that the Holy Spirit flows out of our heart. This is what Jesus said was going to be happening. It wasn't there yet, but it was going to be. And then is if we could say it this way, if the Holy Spirit flows out of our heart, then he is made manifest from us, from the inside out. So notice the Spirit of God was not yet given to humanity. Jesus had the Spirit of God, but Jesus couldn't give him to us until after his death and resurrection. That's why Jesus said it was going to be better for us for him to go back to heaven, go back to the Father, so that he could send the Holy Spirit to not only be with us, but now to be in us. Hallelujah. Luke 11, verse 13, Jesus said, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts, or in other words, natural or carnal, human, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And then Jesus also said in John chapter 16 and verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Hallelujah. That's awesome. If I depart, I will send him to you. So when was the Holy Spirit first given? Great question, right? John 15 and verse 26. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. So again, we see another scripture that says when he comes, um, he's going to proceed from the Father, and he will testify of me. But the question still remains, well, then when did the Holy Spirit come? So notice the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and testifies of Jesus. The testimony of Jesus is the message that is on the heart of the Holy Spirit. This is what he wants to help you with and help me with from the inside out. The Holy Spirit is the power for us to be able to be a witness. Without the help of the Holy Spirit, we are not going to be a witness, and we're not going to be a witness with power, that is for sure. So let's look at Acts chapter 1 and verse 1. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. So this is the account in the book of Acts, which was written by Dr. Luke, and uh, and it says that this is uh, about what Jesus began to teach and do until the day in which he was taken up. So we know that Jesus' earthly ministry was about a three-year ministry. He was 33 years here on the earth, but uh, 30 of those years were in preparation for his three-year earthly ministry that has become the most significant thing in the universe by far. And so until the day in which Jesus was taken up is this phrase. And then it goes on to say, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, have been seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So being assembled together with them, verse 4, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem but to wait for, and notice the language here, wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but here's the promise, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. Verse 8, 
But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Hallelujah. This wasn't something that was just going to be happening in the Holy Land area or the Middle East. This was now going to be good news that was literally going to go all the way to the end of the earth. Praise God. Then over in Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And look at this. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. So first of all, the house gets filled with the presence of God where they are sitting. And then verse 3, it says, Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So notice that, first of all, the room is filled with the presence of God, but then the presence of God comes upon each one of them and fills them with the Holy Ghost. So what was upon them entered into them and filled them up, filled up with the Holy Ghost. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So again, the whole house they were sitting was first filled with the manifestation of the Spirit of God. And then as divided tongues of fire sat upon each of them, they were all filled and the Holy Spirit, uh, with the Holy Spirit, and they manifested the Spirit of God. So what was upon them became in them, and now they manifested from the inside out that very presence of the Lord. What was given was just made available to each of them. So the Holy Spirit had to be given, but he was given to each one of them that were waiting there in that upper room. And when the Holy Spirit came to them, he was able to fill them from the inside out. And again, the evidence in this case was them speaking in tongues and magnifying God. So the point being that what came to them was now flowing out from them. And this is when we see the Holy Spirit first being given, was here in this second chapter of the book of Acts. And, uh, and this whole story here, this whole um, uh, this whole story of the presence of God is just such a, a powerful thing when we realize how the church was birthed in the power of God. And you know what? God authors, he always is the finisher. And what has begun in glory is not going to end fizzled out. So I'm telling you, we are in a stage right now that looks so dark in the natural realm. But I'm telling you, God is not going to ever be outdone. What God has authored in the power of the Holy Ghost, he wants to see us rising up in the authority that God has given us and allow that presence of God that's now in each one of us as believers to be made manifest from us in a daily kind of walk to where we are not only being influenced ourselves, but we are bringing influence to those around us, to our cities, to our state, to our countries, and to generations being impacted as a result. So listen to what Romans chapter 8 and verse 8 and 9 says. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. You're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, in the Holy Spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his, meaning the Lord. You don't belong to the Lord if you don't have the Spirit of God. So everyone who is a believer has the Spirit of God living on the inside of them now. You're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. So again, not just with us, but dwelling in us. Habitation, not just 
visitation. So you can't be a believer without the Spirit of God living in you. This is the whole message of the new covenant. You've become the place of his presence. The Spirit of God literally lives in you. So it is impossible for us to worship God in spirit and in truth without the Spirit of God living inside of us. We can't ask someone not born again to worship in spirit and in truth. This is only reserved for believers. An unbeliever cannot worship in spirit and in truth. Every believer, every unbeliever worships, but only believers are true worshipers. And true worshipers are those that have a relationship with the Lord God through Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. We are the true worshipers, amen, who worship the Father in spirit and in truth. So 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Man, that, that there's so much in that and how we have often taken entire congregations or, or large groups of people that have not even been born again and we're trying to get them into the things of the spirit, so to speak, and worship in spirit and truth when they don't even have a relationship with God yet. They're, they're, they're not born again. And so the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And so it makes no sense whatsoever to try to get unbelievers to worship God according to spirit and truth until they have become a believer. They're certainly invited in, but most of what is going to be happening is going to be foolishness to them until they become a brand new creation and they have a heart change. And once they have that heart change, then everything changes as a result. Glory to God. So again, everyone worships, but only those who are believers, only those who are born again, those who have been made new creations are able to worship the Father in spirit and in truth, as John chapter 4, uh, 20 through 24 talks about. So our relationship with the Holy Spirit, honestly, is foundational to our identity and to the impact on our generation. If we say we believe he lives in us, but then we worship as if he doesn't, and like the Holy Spirit comes and goes, or as if he lives out there somewhere instead of in us, then at best we will be double-minded and unstable in all of our ways. Unstable worship is not where I want to be. How about you? <laughs> Amen. I do not want to be involved in unstable worship or being unstable in all of my ways because I'm operating in covenant clash. The person of the Holy Spirit is not any different than the presence of God. The Holy Spirit doesn't live in us, but his presence doesn't. I mean, think about that. How weird would that be for the Holy Spirit to be in us and yet his presence isn't? It just doesn't make sense. So the Holy Spirit of God lives in you and me if we are believers. We've got the very presence of God living on the inside of us. In fact, let me make a big statement here. We are the place of his presence today. We are the church. We are the body of Christ. We are the temples of the Holy Ghost as we have talked about many times. So it's really time for us to awaken to who we are and to what we have been given and to what we have the ability now to give to others as a result. John 14 and verse 12, Jesus said, I say to you that he who believes in me, the works that I do, he shall do also. So when we read these kind of verses like this in John 14, 12, what, what do we do with that? Do we just hear that and say, oh, that's nice? Or do we hear that and say, yes, I believe that and I am putting that into action from my heart in my life from the inside out starting right now in Jesus name. You see, when we hear the word, but we don't do the word, 
We deceive ourselves. And this is what's been happening to many people. They've been casual hearers of the word, but not doers. And this isn't to condemn anybody. I mean, we're all in growth patterns. We're all growing and we're becoming more and more mature and more and more Christ-like in our lives. But listen, we cannot afford to just simply hear the word of God and then do nothing with it. And Jesus said we would do the same works that he did and even greater still. And I believe that one of the reasons why they're greater still is because now they're literally being done to the ends of the earth. They're being done all over the globe today. So what did Jesus do? The same works that Jesus did, we are to be doing. Well, when you look at the works of Jesus in the Gospels primarily, uh, but through the whole New Covenant, I mean, it becomes obvious that we've got a long way to go, don't we, as the church? We've got to get busy and doing the kingdom of God and making that a priority in our lives and living in this place of our lives being in Christ, our identity knowing who we are in him and who he is in us and that the spirit of god is not out there in outer space someplace the spirit of god is living in us and this is why we have to learn how to worship in spirit and in truth in order to live this from the inside out on a daily and my i might add a practical basis this is not just something to you know get a goosebump or or experience an experience at a conference. This is really for us to be able to be living life in the day-to-day, but in the power of the Holy Ghost as a result. So what do we do with this? Well, I believe we say yes, because every promise in Christ is yes and amen. So now our response to God's yes is to give him our yes. And to say, yes, I'm going to put this into action in my life, and I want to be a doer of the word. I may not have arrived yet, but thank God I've left. Hallelujah. So we always have a choice as to whether or not we are going to respond to what Jesus did. We always have a choice. And of course, the only really wise choice is to say yes. Um, Yeah. I I, uh, have talked about this in the past, how saying no to the Lord doesn't work near as well as saying yes. The song we're saying, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, you know, works a whole lot better than no, Lord, no, Lord, no, no, Lord. Let's not go there. Amen. So he gave us his yes. Now it's time for us to give him our yes and not be sitting on the sidelines and begging for the Holy Ghost to show up when he's been here now since the second chapter of the book of Acts, and he's wanting to do the same works that Jesus did through you and through me. Hallelujah. We're not waiting for God to become powerful or for some revival to hit the earth. God is waiting for us to be revived. He's waiting for our hearts to be turned on fire and get on fire for for the things of the kingdom of God and making that more of a priority in our lives instead of less. Amen? So I worship because I'm loved by God. I don't worship to try to get God to love me. See? I I lift my hands and I bless the Lord because he's worthy. Not to get God to, quote, show up. Wow. I don't sing praise to God so that he will be so pleased that he will manifest his presence. Just, you know, all of a sudden, his presence will manifest because God is so pleased with my praise and my worship. Listen, God could do that anytime he wants to, but here's the deal. He has given us the ability to manifest his presence from what is abiding inside to now flowing out from us in rivers of living water. So instead, I will manifest the life of God that is already in me because of the Holy Spirit. And if God wants to do something over the top, extra on top of that, man, that's like the cherry on the Sunday. But I'm not going to wait and and wait for something like that when God has already given me the green light, when he's already told me to go and to do and to be everything that God has called us to be. It's our time. Really, church, this is our time. And we need to not be fooled 
with what's happening in the natural realm right now or be deceived with what's happening in the natural realm. It is time for us to arise. It's time for us to lift up the sound of the praises of God in the earth and be declaring the word of the Lord and allowing the supernatural life of God that is on the inside of us as believers to be made manifest on the outside. So watch this. Now, because of the life of God that's in me, I worship today from the inside out, not from the outside in. Everything that I do now comes from the heart and it comes from the inside out as a result. So 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5 says we can offer up spiritual sacrifices. Well, see, I don't have to bring a heifer in the back of my station wagon anymore. Praise God. <laughs> I'm so grateful for that. Amen. My sacrifice that I'm going to bring now is from the inside out. I can offer up spiritual sacrifices, which literally Hebrews 13, 15 says is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. That's my sacrifice. I'm going to give thanks to his name even when I'm in the middle of a challenging situation. Even when symptoms are attacking my body or even when the political landscape does not look like I was wanting it to look like. No matter what's happening in the natural realm, remember, what we have inside of us is so much greater than what is trying to come against us. So everything now comes from the inside out as a result of the Spirit of God living on the inside of us. I'm reminded of how we can lay hands on the sick and see them recover. Man, if there was ever a time when we ought to be doing that right now as believers, it's now. We've got such opportunity right now to see the kingdom of God impacting our culture. So I'm going to wrap this up today with this. I want you to remember that not only was Jesus given to us to become our way, our truth and our life, uh, the way that we can have a relationship with the Father in spirit and in truth. It's the only way, is what Scripture says, right? So, not only was Jesus given, but so was the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is not being withheld from us. The Holy Spirit is not out there somewhere just waiting for you to sing the right song, or for you to say the right prayer, or... For you to make the right confession before he can da -da 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 -da, show up and manifest. No, the Holy Ghost was already given over 2,000 years ago. And he is wanting so much for you and I to get a hold of this message that he is now alive on the inside of us and wanting us to manifest him to the outside by laying hands on the sick, by doing the works that Jesus did, delivering people who are oppressed by the devil, raising the dead, you know, uh, doing the, the work of the kingdom of God. And that's exactly what God has designed for every one of us as believers. So I'm telling you, I truly believe that our best is yet to come. We have not seen anything like what we're going to see. And remember, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. And so I want to just pray for you as we wrap this up today and encourage you with the fact that the Holy Spirit has already been given. So let's celebrate that grace that God has given to us, that he wants to have operative through us in Jesus' name. Father, I just thank you for our time together. I thank you for everyone who is listening to this uh, live or we'll be catching this in our archives. And Lord, I just thank you that no weapon formed against us prospers and every tongue risen in judgment is shown to be in the wrong. We bless you, Lord God, that we are the place of your presence. We are the very temples of the Holy Ghost and that we can do the same works that Jesus did in the earth today, all because of the power to become a witness in our generation. Father, I bless you for it. I thank you and I give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. I sure love you. And thank you again for spending these 30 minutes with us on a Friday afternoon. And uh, again, write us your comments or your questions. We love hearing from you. And we look forward to being together again next time.
God bless you. Bye-bye.